Okay, so hello and welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Martin Ambor, and when it comes to various things called SRA and GCC, it's usually my fault or I was somehow involved. And this talk is about my recent re-implementation of the interprocedural SRA pass. Uh, the SRA comes from uh, scalar replacement of aggregates, and the pass is named that way because when I was re-implementing the normal intra-procedural uh, traditional scalar replacement of aggregates a long time ago, we were also at the time working already with Honza on various interprocedural stuff and the idea was, well, it would be nice to split uh, parameters that are aggregates as well, at least in the functions where we can do it, where we do have a complete control over them. So if they're static, or with LTO when we know they are, <clears throat> they are local to the thing that we are currently uh, optimizing, which can be the whole program, whole shared, shared library, and so forth. So yeah, it can split stuff, split aggregates into parts, but then it mm, became quite obvious that there are a few other things that might be very useful, and uh, the most simple one is removal of unused parameters. It uh, was also, Mm, quite clear that we mm, we were dealing with value that was you know or with, with with stuff that's passed by reference which could be passed by value then it would be worthwhile to try and uh, and uh, convert it into that to passing that way and uh, I've been asked over the years to also do the same for return values which until now was not possible but with this new implementation it is so that is new I will go through uh, these transformations briefly uh, to you know, show you examples of what they are. Uh, then I will have a look how this, uh, why we needed a new implementation, how that new implementation works, what are some of the uh, interesting implementation details of it, and then I'll cover some results. So the SRA, the you know, splitting parameters, splitting aggregates is fairly straightforward if you have uh, some you know um, function uh, process one that's supposed to be certainly int not foo but you know a process function process l uh, that operates uh, on uh, some structure but it actually only uses one field of that structure. It uh, can be beneficial not to pass all you know the whole structure, especially if it's a big one on the stack, but uh, to load in the caller only the fields that are used in the function and that call the function with uh, that particular, hopefully, scalar or at least smaller, it doesn't even have to be scalar, smaller fields, small, the data that it actually operates on. When it comes to you know, dealing with stuff passed by value, what we also do, what we also can do uh, under certain right set of conditions is that when we have the, you know, the same function, that uh, loads one of the fields or some part of the aggregate uh, through a pointer and uh, it only works on part of the aggregate uh, and especially, well, in, in this case, you know, the actual value that, if that actual value it operates on uh, is a scalar and uh, you can parameterize it, but in both the old and new, uh, you know, we can actually pass double the size of the pointer and still consider it beneficial. We will do that transformation, dereference uh, that pointer in the caller and uh, pass it to the callee, which then, uh, which then uh, works on actual scalar values passed by value rather than reference. The hope um, uh, is that if we are lucky enough, uh, the, in the caller, the aggregate will after some of these transformations uh, perhaps not be address taken anymore, and then we could also do the traditional SRA and um, optimize it more. Usually this, when, when people request uh, that this happens, when they are unhappy that this uh, doesn't happen or didn't happen in the past, like in this uh, bug report, 81248, I, I, you know, I don't expect you to read through that, but basically it usually involves a lot of standard template library stuff, the pair, taking address of pairs, passing it somewhere where it would be just you know, better to take the two numbers and pass it to that functions. 
and so forth. So it is, again, an, one of the ways how we remove all the layers of abstractions that things like heavy templated C++ code um, impose on the compiler. Removing unused parameters is very, very simple. Sometimes it just happens that for some reason uh, there is a, a parameter in a function, or the function has a formal parameter that it doesn't use. It is there um, because, you know, for historical reasons, because why it might, once it might be useful, because it should be there for consistency. Uh, it can also happen that, uh, you know, originally in the source code, the function is indirectly called, but Early optimizations can figure it out. Early lining and, and, and propagation figure it out. Okay, this is you know this function is actually only called directly. It's over here. We know it, and uh, the parameter is not parameter is not used. Then the function is all under our control. We know all the callers, and uh, we can just remove the parameter that is not that is not used. More, or quite another quite or quite frequent example is this one, where also taken from GCC, where if you look at the parameters that you can see, they are all actually used in, in the function. But there is one parameter you cannot, you, you cannot see. It's the this pointer. Uh, and that one, at least, you know, if, if, if you look at the gimple dump, you, could, you, you then can see. And the optimizer, of course, of course, can see that this pointer is not used in any way. And that uh, this function could have been a static method. But, of course, why should the programmer care what, you know, to, 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 you know, to make things a static method uh, just to make the compiler happy or, or make the compiler not pass an extra parameter in the call and uh, the compiler can do it and in this case uh, the compiler does so can detect that this pointer is not necessary and is removed. Now but all of these cases and the can be that I've shown you so far uh, could already be handled by the old IPS array and uh, Actually, the removal of parameters can, uh, th those that I have shown you so far, uh, can be an R uh, <laughs> and is dealt with with the constant propagation, with the interprocedural constant propagation pass, which uh, when it evaluates whether a constant in a parameter is beneficial or not, it has to have an idea about the uses of that parameter. And if there are no uses, it knows it and can just, you know, again, if it knows the, all the calls, it can just remove it and it does so. And, um, but, there, but it is really just something that was added to the pass uh, as a useful afterthought. And uh, uh, there are things that the IPSRA, the new one, uh, can handle that this approach cannot. The um, example, this one, is also from GCC, we have a function which is called get constraints for component reference, which is interested, or at least it claims so, that you know, whether what you're looking at is left-hand side or not. And it uses that parameter, it passes it to its helper function get constraints for underscore one, which in turn uses it only to call itself and the first function. So we have a recursive loop where you know, these two functions are passing this parameter one to another, uh, but no, but, you know, none of them really need it. So, you know, if we work, if we manage to operate on the whole call graph or and, and all uh, on whole um, SCCs, a strongly connected components, then we can figure this out as well and we can remove the parameter. The old IPS array, however, uh, was not in a position to do it. The old IPS RA is, in GCC speak, uh, an intra-procedural normal gimbal pass that sits uh, in the early optimization pipeline. And what it does is that it, you know, it analyzes the current function that it is, you know, that, that it is given uh, by the pass manager. And um, uh, when it figures out that you know, the function is not addressable and and, and is local and has un, you know, parameters that can be split or that can be removed, it um, then looks at, it, it switches the const context from under the pass manager without the pass manager knowing it, it pops the C fund and pushes the C fund of a caller and then changes the call. Uh, and uh, on top of that, it also 
uh, clones the current, you know, b before that it actually clones the current function because we need a clone for debugging for purposes so that we have an abstract origin and then replaces this function with, uh, or replaces the, the old current function with this modified new function with, with, with modified signature and then uh, switches contacts to all the callers. So, so in, th in this example, if it was you know, removing unused from uh, function buzz, it would switch its contents to the caller bar and then removed the actual parameter from the call to buzz and then it would switch back and, and, and of course it would have to switch to all the callers, which would remove the unused parameter from buzz and uh, then you know, the, the early optimizations would continue in topological order. So at, after some time, bar would be uh, visited. Bar at that point, if, if previously it only used the unused parameter to you know, pass it to buzz, now the buzz would not have any, um, any uh, actual argument at all. So this would be unused and the whole process would be repeated and uh, you know, provided there was no recursion, the, un the unused um, parameter, even though if, if it was passed from one function to another, would be removed. But of course, this doesn't work in, uh, when recursive calls. It has a special way of detecting self-recursion, but once at least two functions are involved, uh, you it cannot do anything with it. Another problem is that even when the even when the parameters are not uh, passed from one function to another. Whenever you have a recursion, whenever you have a strongly connected component in a call graph, the topological sort can sort them in any way it wants. And very often what happened is that, well, IPSRA couldn't do anything about bar, so, so it didn't do anything, doesn't do anything about bar. Then in the topological sort, pass manager moves on to foo, and now foo can have a parameter removed, so it does have a parameter removed. And then all callers need to be need to be updated. And one of the callers is already processed function bar, and this used to cause a lot of issues in GCC because bar was considered to be done. It, it, it shouldn't, you know, it, it, it at some point in the past, now we're doing things differently, even had its uh, inlining parameters calculated, which needed to be recalculated, and a lot of other stuff needed to be recalculated, and all this you know, messing with the pass manager logic, uh, which was fairly nasty and involved a lot of push siphons, uh, push current function and pop current function calls, and so forth, uh, was fairly nasty. We managed to work around them in the ages, but eventually something better was needed. And something better is this new pass that sits in the, uh, you know, among the true GCC IPA passes. Uh, currently, I, I think the best spot uh, is after IPA CP, the, the constant propagation, uh, interprocedural one. And because it is a true interprocedural pass, even you know, in, in GCC speak, it uh, operates on the whole call graph, operates on the whole program in LT, LTO mode even. And so when we do have four functions that call each other and pass to each other some debugging parameter that you, know, you don't need in release build or on your architecture or something, you know, or if they, for example, return values that uh, is actually not necessary and they don't have to return anything, uh, you have to have, you, you can do it in the new pass and the new pass manages to, to work um, on these strongly connected components. And I was already mentioning LTO, so even when you happen to have some of these functions in one compilation unit and another co functions in another compilation unit, the pass is still able to deal with it. Apart from that, when it comes to you know, activity, uh, I was already mm, talking about a lot of pushing current functions and popping current functions. The placement of the pass was really very sub-ideal, as I realized when I uh, finished the first prototype, which basically worked uh, at the beginning of uh, this year. And I was comparing it to the old one, right? I, I mostly you know, wanted to see whether it works, if it doesn't ice and doesn't miscompile, but also wanted to see whether it actually does anything, because if it never detected any unused parameters, then of course it 
wouldn't miscompile anything and it would appear to work but not really do anything useful. So I added you know, simple logging uh, to a slash temp directory uh, of activity of the old pass. And uh, I thought, okay, well, where, where do I try it? And uh, I decided that some C++ benchmark mid-sized program would be appropriate. And uh, in spec 2017, we have this Zalan CVMK program, uh, you know, where the old IPSRA was fairly active. So I thought, okay, let's see what the new one does. The old one managed to change 11,000 functions, roughly. And uh, the new one did 144, with LTO, by the way. And the, the, for, the, for the old IPSRA, because it is an early pass, it doesn't matter which LTO or not. It, it works at the compilation phase, even in the LTO scheme of things. So you know that, that doesn't matter. But now, when we are analyzing the whole program, it's 144 um, changed functions. So okay, that's, that doesn't look good. Uh, something somewhere is you know, not working. So I thought, okay, so maybe, maybe it's all removed parameters that IPA constant propagation uh, was already removed. And that's why this pass, which runs only afterwards, doesn't see them, but but no. When I switched off uh, constant propagation, there were you know there were a few more functions that were modified, but still still definitely not on the order of eleven thousand. But I also noticed that the total number of functions that the whole program analysis phase of uh, the benchmark compilation saw was thirteen thousand. So so roughly the same order as the number of functions that the old pass modified. I thought, okay, this is something something can't be right. This is, you know, it, it is not possible that the old that the old pass modified almost every functions. So I thought, okay, so these are definitely the, the, the small functions that get early in line. And apparently, what's happening is that the old IPSRA modifies function, but it doesn't really matter because it gets immediately in the next step, it gets in line to the caller, it gets in, it gets in line everywhere, and uh, you know, it's, it's just useless work. And to some extent, that was work. Uh, that was that was true. When I disabled early inlining, uh, all of a sudden uh, IPSRA you know, were, was modifying 4,000 functions out of quite a few uh, more in the whole program. Still not the same uh, amount of number of uh, functions as before. So I looked at the activity of the old one and I realized that because of com dots, it was actually, you know, many of those functions in different files were actually the same functions, the IPSRA because of uh, how CGraph uh, API works, allows to privatize com dots when possible. And that's what was happening. So actually, the, the correct number was not 11,000 to compare to, but 5,000. And th there was even more useless work because we also modified about 1,200 uh, functions that were removed as unreachable. At the LTO level, we realized that, okay, these functions will never be called and we pruned them uh, through, you know, pruned them from the program. So, you know, modifying them, transforming them was useless work. So, IP, old IPSRA had all these pass ordering problems also, and uh, probably does still a lot of useless work. I didn't forget about removing return values. This is a, I would say, fairly typical example, also from uh, GCC, from uh, value numbering. We have a visit statement function which diligently returns true when it changed the value number of uh, the statement. But, uh, or pro of the statement, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> or of the result of the statement, uh, probably. Um, that doesn't matter. The thing that matters is that no caller of this function cares about the return value. It's just. You know, it's, it's, it's probably a good interface to have it there. Maybe one time, sometime, you know, one day someone will care and it's gonna be useful that it's there. You know, it's, it's, it's not worth ripping it out of the compiler, but no caller cares. And, and, and moreover, mm, visit statement mm, diligently queries uh, or when it calls all of its helper functions, it checks what they return and they also return uh, true when they uh, changed the value number but uh, yeah, that value is only used to be returned, and uh, you know, because since nobody cares, it's, pro it's probably better just to remove that return statement, remove all the computation, not only not just from this function, but also from these helper functions that, uh, according to the dump, 
um, of the pass, also all of them had their return value removed as unnecessary. Last in this long introduction is that uh, um, the pass, because it is an interprocedural one, is you know sits in many places at once when it comes to the LTO compilation method. So when we use GCC to compile a source file into an object file, it builds summary of each function, which uh, seems like it can be a candidate for the transformation. At the whole program analysis uh, point, the decisions are made, and the actual transformation are done in yet another executable, possibly in parallel, when we process the various partitions of uh, the program, and when we actually have function bodies. So in the next uh, part of my talk, what I will do is that I will uh, talk uh, uh, first about how we gather data and how we do the decision what needs to be done. I will talk about removal of return values first, then about removal of parameters, and then about splitting. This is not the actual order in which um, this is done in the past, but uh, it, is, it is in the order of slightly increasing complexity, and it, hopefully it will be easier to follow. And then afterwards we will talk about transformation. So unused return value remo removal. Per function, we just need, when we gather the summaries or build the summaries of each candidate function, just two things. The first thing is actually not specific to the removal of the return value. It is just, is this something, is this a function that uh, you know, is uh, a candidate for any IPASRA IP transformation? And a function may not be a candidate when, for example, it has its tree used attri attribute. Uh, which means that it is used in a way that not known to the compiler, then we cannot do anything about it. Or, or when we cannot change the signature of the function for some other reasons, there is a number of, number of them. The one that's specific to removal of unused return value, uh, values is that we actually save a bit into the summary when the function r returns value so that we don't care about functions which don't. Per call, uh, we return two other flags. One is, is this return value ignored? So when we look at a call statement, a Gimple call statement, and it doesn't have any left-hand uh, side, then we set this flag. When it does have a left-hand side, but that left-hand side is only used to calculate the return value of the function in which the statement, in which the statement, uh, in which the call statement is, um, we set the other flag. It's called return, uh, returns return. So. It, it is only used to calculate the return value. It doesn't, have, doesn't mean that um, it uh, has to be returned immediately. For example, in this uh, example, in we, have, we call function foo, and the result is the SSA name A10, which uh, then is our argument to a fee node, which has the result A4. A4 goes through one addition to get uh, the underscore three um, anonymous SSA, SSA name that is com used to calculate underscore 12, and underscore 12 is returned. If you, and, and you know, I can, I can tell you that all the, um, that you can see all the uses of the SSA names that are defined in the snippet, you can easily follow, um, you know, e easily deduce by just following the left-hand side from uh, the statements that, that the A10 is only used to come up with a uh, return value of the current function, and therefore we can uh, set the other bit. The bar is the same thing, that's also the, the underscore two, is then only undergoes the same two additions and is used to uh, return, to calculate the return value of the current function. So this is what we do at the compilation phase or, or uh, uh, in LTO. If, if you don't use LTO, the pass is still split into the same three components so that it's the same thing. And uh, during summary building, it will gather the same information. Then at the whole program analysis or the interprocedural decision stage, as we also call it, uh, what happens is that we traverse the call graph from uh, callers to callees. So in this most simple example, when we have function, F, function F1 and F2, 
they both call function f3 and we have recorded previously that the return value is ignored then we can decide that f3 also doesn't need to you know return anything or not oh yeah not also but that f3 doesn't need to return anything and we can mark it for a return value removal later on as we move down in the topological sort of uh, the call graph we come across function g4 and we can see that it's being called by f2 which has you know which return uh, again, again which ignores the return value and by function f3 which you know does note the return value but it's only used to return or it was in the original program only used to return uh, to construct the return value of f3 but that has been removed so g4 can also have its uh, return value removed so it's a simple transitive um, idea there of course what we need to be careful about are the you know is recursion as i w which is the thing that i was talking about and uh, when we have strongly connected components we uh, have to treat the um, treat the edges that go in between uh, nodes of the same uh, component optimistically first and uh, if we don't find any mm, and the reason why we were wrong in those optimistic assumptions, you know, we can be happy with that and mark all those return values uh, for removal as well. Assuming, of course, that all of these uh, fungi, all of these calls uh, use the return to re use the return value of the calls to actually return uh, to construct the return value of the function of the calling function. But if there is some problem, for example, if yeah, in this particular call we need to have the return value, and, and, and then uh, uh, we need to undo the optimistic, optimistic decisions and iteratively in a simple uh, stack propagation algorithm undo these decisions and, and, and make sure that you know, these functions in the strongly con connected component uh, keep their return value. And that's the whole idea of the return uh, value removal. Works very nicely. Unused parameter removal is very similar. Per function formal parameter, so not really per, per function, but per, per its parameter and its signature, we also keep just one flag. And that, is, uh, and that flag means this parameter is locally unused. So it means that we if we use it in the function, we were still, you're still allowed to use it when the flag is set, but it's only uh, in order to calculate actual argument of another call. And uh, the idea is that, uh, the, the hope is that if in that call e function, the thing you calculated is not necessary, then it won't be necessary even here. So, you know, this is a pseudo C example when we have function bar which has a parameter useless and useless too which are not immediately useless because they are being used to calculate the third argument of a call uh, to foo we still mark them as you know if they don't have any other uses we'll still mark them as uh, locally unused and we hope then that during the interprocedural phase we figure out that foo doesn't need its third parameter and then we will be able to conclude that bar doesn't need its, four, its third and fourth parameter as well. And that of course means that we have to track the, what happens in the calls um, and uh, for, uh, and yeah, for, for, for each actual argument, we record up to seven scalar sources, you know, the, the, the formal parameters that were used to calculate uh, this actual argument. Um, for aggregates, we do just one because there is, of course, no data flow and it could be added, but would be more difficult. And of course, it, there are not too many operations on aggregates, so it wouldn't be that useful anyway. During the interprocedural decision phase, um, again, the I idea is very similar. There are only two um, differences. The first difference is that, yeah, one, one parameter can, or 
or that the number of parameters can feed into one, so it's you know, slightly complicated where we work more on, on the individual parameters and not uh, so much on the functions. And the second difference is that whereas previously we were going from callers to callees, so on my slides we were going top to bottom, now we'll be, go we will be traversing our call graph bottom up from callees to the callers. So when you have function F1 and it has a parameter that's locally unused, it's, and it's really unused, so we can just remove it, provided that we have control over F1, all the calls to F1. When we have function F3, that has a parameter that it doesn't use except for passing it to F1 and F2. At that point, you know, wh when we get to it, uh, we know that F1 and F2 can't, you know, don't need that parameter, that it is useless there, so we can remove it in F3, F3 as well. Of course, again, strongly connected components are an issue. Uh, what happens is that again we first optimistic we first deal with the, all the edges from the component going out of the component and uh, propagate any mm, oh, oh, any need uh, up there and uh, mm, provided that there is none uh, we are done. If there is some, then of course, G, you know, that parameter in G6 will be marked uh, as needed. And uh, again, we will be iterating over the strongly connected component, uh, propagating the need to have that parameter back um, across the call graph edges. And uh, when everything stabilizes, we are done. And after that, we will be able to signal to the continuation of the algorithm that, well, these parameters are actually necessary. We cannot remove them in callies to G4 and G6. So, so it's really, really something, really, you know, the same thing, just the other way around, and done on parameters rather than on return values. Parameter splitting is uh, slightly more difficult because, uh, yeah, we're just not marking things as, as used or not. We actually have to record what we are using and uh, how. I'm sorry. So for example, in this you know, function which gets a really big structure which it doesn't need, it is happy with just A and C except that it may need it because then it passes the whole thing to bar. What we record are the, actually, uh, the, the actual loads or the, the accesses when it comes to uh, stuff passed by value loads uh, from the interesting parameters. So we record that there is a load from of type unsigned at offset zero size four and it is a load from the structure, so it's, you know, it's certain it will be there, it's absolutely necessary. Uh, similarly, the same thing for the load of SC, it's just at offset eight. And then we pass the whole thing uh, to a bar. And uh, if it happens that this is necessary, that we cannot do anything with this, uh, then we cannot modify the functions because the you know, IPSRA will not create replacements for overlapping bits of the original aggregate uh, for obvious reasons. But the hope is that you know, if, if this happens, hopefully bar also doesn't need all of it. Maybe it just uh, accesses B or, or, or only A and we will be able to uh, get away with just passing the things to uh, foo that both uh, foo and bar need and to bar only what bar needs. So, you know, we record that access, but we actually mark it as uncertain and hope that the IPSRA, uh, at the, the IPA level and the decision level, we will be able to figure out that we don't actually need it or replace it with something smaller. And uh, in order to do some mapping, we of course uh, have to, um, in, you know, mapping in between parameters of distinct functions uh, we have to mark that on the call graph from foo to bar, uh, the first aggregate parameter is uh, the first parameter of foo. Yeah, so you know, this, and then if this is all that we are, if this were the call graph, uh, then um, provided that bar only needed, for example, A, 
we would be able to pull the uh, or if, if it, yeah we would need to pull a from bar to foo because a is already there a meaning offset uh, access at offset zero but if it needed b we would pull b and uh, we would end up with foo having three accesses not overlapping smaller and candidates for good candidates uh, for the transformation uh, the propagation is done in the same way as uh, the parameter removal, unused parameter removal, just that we are, we are pulling these accesses and actually deciding whether you know, uncertain accesses are certain and uh, then figuring out whether you know, there are uh, few enough replacements to actually do the replacement. Uh, and and the, the algorithm is otherwise very, very similar. It's just much more code because, of course, we are copying structures rather than just marking bits. When it comes to passing stuff by value rather than by reference, we have to be, you know, the, the algorithm is pretty much the same thing. We just add a special flag that says this used to be by reference and we are um, converting it to by value. But we have to be careful about two things that are quite important. One is that uh, when it comes to stuff originally passed by reference, we avoid any modifications. One thing is modified, you know, the, the, the old IPS array would be able to convert that to an address of the component of the aggregate. I think that's, that, that turned out to be pretty much never useful, uh, so we no longer do that. But we, of course, have to be careful that uh, there is not a modification through alias. And we must not introduce segmentation faults when previously there were none. Uh, this <laughs> example mm, demonstrates both of these issues. What, you know, what, what, we are, what we would like to do is remove the pointer p with just the uh, integer a and uh, you know, not, not have it consume pointer. But there are, of course, two issues. One is that before the load, we have some store somewhere, and uh, if it actually overwrote uh, the value of A, we, we wouldn't, you know, working with the old A would be bad. This can, of course, be solved you know, using type-based alias analysis. At this point, we know what the type of uh, PA is. We can feed that into the alias analysis oracle, and if that some pointer is, for example, floating point, uh, a pointer to a floating point value, TBAA will figure that out and will tell us, okay, that load is safe. You know, it's still the same value as the beginning of the function. Uh, but we have a second problem, of course, and that's, you know, we don't always do the dereference. And if, if we only do it conditionally, that pointer can be invalid value or null. And if we tried to move that dereference from these functions to the caller, we would, of course, introduce segmentation fault. Um, so w one idea was to make sure that uh, the excesses are um, dereference on all paths in the function from entry to exit. Um, the, both the old IPS array and the new one, which reuses the same algorithm, just make sure that uh, in, in all paths uh, enough of the part of the aggregate is dereference. So you know, uh, P, well actually, yeah, so, 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 so if, if, if alias was not a problem in this particular case, there would be a dereference of a, of a sufficient offset on, on all paths, and uh, this could be still be considered a candidate uh, for the transformation. However, the bigger problem, and something that might lead to I don't want to say regressions, uh, but uh, situations which the new IPSRA cannot handle, whereas the old one uh, can, is um, when we have a function in between. So when we have a caller of foo that is called var, and we are looking at the same issues, but we don't have any references, any, uh, any dereferences, any loads uh, from pointer p um, in function bar. We only pass that pointer to function and but, but we would still, you know, it would be nice, you know, to replace that pointer with uh, the actual things that these functions work with. However, the first problem is much more fundamental. Whereas 
on, on the left, we knew what the types of the actual loads were. Now we don't know. We only know that there is a uh, call to function foo. Remember, uh, function bar can be in a different compilation unit. And therefore, we do not have a type that we could feed into type-based alias analysis to find out whether some pointer, modification from through some pointer to is a problem or not. Um, the only way this, the new IPSRA deals with it is that it only allows um, such pass-throughs uh, when the call is uh, the, w w when the virtual operand, virtual SSA memory operand is the default definition, which basically means if it's the first function that ever, you, um, or, or if it uses the memory as it was uh, when the whole memory as it was when function bar was invoked, which is a very strict requirement, and of course, very often it fails. We are also seeing issues with the, oh, with, with the other problem. If foo is called conditionally, then of course we cannot uh, possibly propagate uh, through, or not propagate, but we cannot um, move the dereferences to, um, to the caller of bar because they might be invalid, pointer p might not, you know, might, might contain null uh, in some situations in the program. So we either make sure that, um, that the call post dominates the entry uh, basic block, or the other more lenient option is to see, well, if, if bar, or if foo actually uses the same excesses as we already do, then and, and we definitely dereference them, then this is not a problem. And uh, we can, uh, you know, we know that the reference will be there before the call or, the, uh, or after. And, uh, and uh, we are fine uh, with doing that, provided that we check that that is actually the case, you know, the, uh, that, that those are the same accesses being lo loaded in foo as, as in bar at the IPA level where we compare the accesses when we are pulling them from the callee to the caller, or we're not trying to do that. But, but yeah, the first thing is that, um, unfortunately, the TB, you know, the type-based alias analysis issue is a, is a, is a, is a big one, uh, this one. And uh, if it turns out to be a problem, uh, what we can do is that we, we could build summaries of functions in topological order and then optimistically try type-based alias analysis on the excesses that we see in the, in, 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 in the callees and hope that uh, all of them are there. Uh, but yeah, it depends to be seen whether this is something that you know, people will want to have fixed or not. Transformation. So again, uh, back to the LTO scheme of things. Uh, when the whole program analysis phase makes some decisions, it records them, but that's just really recorded decisions in the call graph. The actual modifications of the function bodies are done when we are compiling the different partitions where the bodies are actually loaded. The whole program analysis uh, part does not even have, unless it specifically requests to uh, access to the bodies of the functions. And uh, just to demonstrate how messy this can get even on a, you know when using just a few functions let's assume that you know this is what a part of the call graph looks like we have functions f1 f2 f3 f4 and 5 and 6 and in the original program and then we will see how other passes or the passes that i'm involved with that i had to deal with most when writing mm, the new ips array how uh, they you know what they can do and how they interact so the first one is uh, inter-procedural constant propagation. So let's assume that IPACP decides that in the context of calls from F2 and F3, it is beneficial to clone function F4 and it creates this virtual clone. It is called uh, CP4 where it records, okay, the third parameter is always 16 and uh, records that in the transformation information of that clone. Then, as it happens, F4 is also a good candidate 
and a, a four and a five are good candidates for IPSRA. Let's say that one of their one of their parameters can be split, for example. And so what happens is that the pass clones CP4 and it clones F4, and uh, because both of them are good candidates and also with five, and uh, you, you already see that uh, the tree of clones, which are those dashed green lines, starts to be slightly complicated, but that unfortunately usually is not the end of the story. When, when stuff starts to happen uh, to nodes, um, inlining usually does something too. So inlining may decide that, in the, that it would be nice to inline S4B um, into F3, so that's why that arrow is red because eventually the idea is that those were not those are not going to be independent functions, but that uh, I4B is actually going to be stuck instead of the call into F3. And uh, this is what the call graph looks like. So one should note that again. No function bodies, no gimbal statements were copied in the process. These are just representations of what the passes would like to do um, and how they would like to redirect call, call edges, which uh, will eventually have the effect on the appropriate gimbal statements. And uh, then also it tags along um, these virtual clones with information what to do to them in order to uh, achieve the desired desired optimization. And uh, we don't really have to care about, about call from CP4 now because you know nothing calls that. It now only is there to record that some constant propagation has to happen. So this is then transferred to the you know Ltrans part of LTO and materi clone materialization takes place, which means that uh, we have to create all though we have to create S4A S4B, and we have to inline uh, I4, you know, I4B into F3. Um, so the part, uh, the C graph uh, or the call graph infrastructure starts with F4. We will concentrate on F4. The the, uh, the situation is with F5 is far, rather trivial, and uh, it will copy the body to create a CP4, uh, uh, even though it is not at the moment necessary. Uh, but it is transformed. The constant propagation takes place. So wh whatever uh, before was a parameter is now 16 because that's what was deemed beneficial and it is now a known fact. Now that mm, does not have an, it doesn't, the CP4 doesn't have any uses of its own. So it, you know, the uh, function body doesn't need to be copied once again, but we can already rename it to be S4B. And now, uh, the IPASRA transformation of the body needs to take place. So if there was a par parameter that now needs to be split, it will be split. All the loads through that parameter will be replaced uh, with uh, uses of the new parameters. And then inlining uh, will take place, which inlining is rather special uh, all over the call graph infrastructure. And it will copy the, this transformed body and it will stuck it directly into F3. Uh, then, of course, the you know one remaining copy of F4 will still be remaining, it's still the, the green one on the left, and that one will be um, transformed into S4A by doing the same IPS hurry transformations that we did before. And uh, then we will do the same for S5. So that, unfortunately, is not the end of the story. Um, because there's one bit of call graph uh, of, uh, of function buddies that is not really, really transformed as it should be. Call redirection is done at the end. When everything is done, only then we redirect edges. So before edge, re edge redirection and after body transformation, we still have gimbal statements that, you know, uh, uh, that, uh, that point to the nodes, or to the declarations rather, corresponding to the nodes uh, that these blue dotted edges show. And I only uh, added those uh, edges which are different than the call graph edges. Uh, the, and, 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 and there is no real call in F3 to I4B 
So that's, there is no uh, dotted uh, edge either. But this is what it happens, and the edge redirection has to fix up the statements. And it also has to fix up, now that it knows, knows where things actually lead, it also has to fix up uh, the, uh, the arguments. Uh, in, in the current, current state of things, before I commit IPSRA, uh, it can only remove parameters, and still at that point you would have there parameters that shouldn't be there, that, 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 the, caller, that the callees already don't know about, uh, in their transport bodies, but before edge redirections, they still sit there for a short period of while. Of course, in new IPSRA, we have to do a little bit more when we want to split stuff than uh, just remove it, and it gets slightly more complicated, and that's where the one hack comes into place. But first, let's just, yeah, let's just also have a look at how stuff is recorded in, in, in the call graph once we are there. And, uh, it's usually mixed back in the, the path managing it somehow itself. So for example, the constant propagation uh, is w when it uh, mm, propagates alignments and st stuff like that, that that is kept in its data structures. But the replacement of scalar values uh, is, uh, is marked in a call graph, um, call graph, I mean a bit of a call graph that is, clo that is called CGraph clone info which is the tree map, uh, because it just fits so nicely how, um, how bodies are materialized, and there's a lot of mapping being done, so let's just do this mapping on top of it. Um, and then currently there, there are those bitmaps of arguments that need to be skipped. In the new scheme of things, we still have the tree map, although I removed unnecessary things from there, and we have m slightly more complicated structure of parameter adjustments. And then uh, for the reasons of uh, tracking what we're, what's being done in different stages, uh, also the perform splits. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm slightly running out of time. Uh, so, you know, this is uh, what the different uh, new structures mm, uh, are, what goals they are. Basically, what I did is that I added IPA param adjustments to each um, clone info, uh, which means into each call graph node, and therefore it has to be small and it only can do a limited amount of things. Uh, for the actual transformation of bodies, I rewrote the things that we had in IPA param manipulations.c, and there is now a new class, which is more, more robust. It only lives a short period of time. It's not really not really very careful about memory because, yeah, it usually lives, lives uh, only when we materialize a clone, but it can have standalone uses as well. So if you want to change, you know, the, the signature of a function in some other context rather than IPA, for example, OMP SIMD clone does it when it, uh, you know, clones functions and then modifies its signature, uh, this is the interface that you should probably look at. IPM param perform split is something that we do to track, uh, um, to, to pass information from, from uh, transformation of the body to transformation of the functions. And um, this is the example that is at the beginning of the IPA, uh, of the IPA param manipulation.c file. So I will really only really go very quickly through it. But if we have a situation when uh, we have function foo and bar, uh, bar calls foo, and um, we should, what, what we would like to do is to, yeah, just replace the structure in foo with simple integer and in bar with just two integers with one being passed to foo, uh, we need an SSA name to do it. But um, at the body transformation, we don't really touch the, the, the call statements. That's something for a call redirection that, you know, that, that really knows where that call will end up. Uh, but at a call uh, redirection state, we cannot really pull out SSA names out of thin air. We, we have to have them in the statements to be the correct ones because inlining might happen in between them. So it's not even a default definition. It's just, you just have no idea where it was unless it's in there in, in, in the statement somewhere. So what happens is that we create a special dummy decal to represent the original parameter. Uh, we create actually an expression based on dummy decal so that we know what the offset 
of the into the our formal parameter is the actual parameter of the original call. Then we dump all the SSA names more than is you know necessary, and then at the call redirection uh, time, uh, only the correct SSA name will be will be selected, and we will end up with only the one and correct SSA name there. Results. Our favorite benchmarks. Uh, the pass does something. I mean, that's it's it's not it's, it's, it's a, it is a useful transformation. I believe people have been asking about it, especially you know about the removal of parameters and and, and return values, and occasionally also about splitting stuff. Um, we also we of course have to test everything on Tramp 3D, and uh, so we do. Um, and uh, yeah, six functions had their return value removed. Uh, Twenty one percent of functions had. The, their parameters modified out of the functions that we see at the uh, IPA stage, so after early inlining, it's, it's without all doing without doing any unnecessary work in this regard. But uh, however, there is still the late inlining, and uh, it's in in this case less than 20% survived those the, you know that inlining, or, or and were, were were not inlined into another function. Uh, usually, it's about 20% uh, of the ISRI uh, functions that survive into the optimized dump, but often one is in line into another, so, so you know, uh, it's not that they would disappear. Uh, yeah, OS is not really interesting. With Firefox, we were dealing with about, you know, we were modifying 6% of the functions uh, in total, which, uh, you know, I, I originally measured almost 15, but then uh, I fixed fixed the path that it didn't clone stuff unnecessarily when IPA CP already removed the parameters, and these are the, these are the uh, function, uh, you know, these are the final result. Martin built uh, about almost 6,000 OpenSUSE packages with the patch, and, uh, you know, just to make sure that it didn't ice, um, but we also collected some statistics. And uh, the best result was package smem. It is a package which has four functions. Three of them can have return uh, value removed. The fourth one is main. <laughs> and so it's, yeah, 75% success. Um, but, yeah, so, so I selected only the 100 packages with most functions at the uh, whole program analysis state. By the way, you, you, this, uh, it has been mentioned here in the morning that we built the distribution with LTO, so all of these, all of these numbers are uh, with link time optimization. And, uh, you know, you can, as you can see, there are packages where uh, we get over the 10%, uh, many where we get over, you know, Half uh, in about half of them, we get over five. It is very rough statistics, of course. Um, when you then later look at those slides, you can see what happens. The, the 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 package that got the biggest percentage was Ceph. It was the 15th biggest package in terms of number of functions in the uh, world, whole program analysis stage. Uh, so 377,000 functions, almost 20 of them percent were modified, mostly parameters were removed, which means that there is probably a lot of recursion. Um, CEP test was the second one. It's probably not very, very, very interesting. The third one was interesting. It's something called Wesnock, a turn-based strategy game with a fantasy theme. Uh, that's where I looked how many of the functions uh, survived uh, late inlining, and it was slightly above 20%. LLVM is 10th. Uh, TensorFlow was quite notable, especially because it also had many parameters split apart from just um, parameters and return values removed. Chromium was uh, around 7%. Uh, Mozilla was, was, was something like 4, I believe, because it's not just Libxil, the biggest uh, library in, in Firefox, but all of the package. This is the picture again. And uh, I've almost run out of time, so if you have any questions, I'm afraid we'll have to be quite quick, but I'll be happy to answer them either now or later. Uh, so, uh, one thing is, uh, do you consider any interactions between, for instance, the uh, return value removal and parameter removal? Like, if a function returns uh, a parameter and suddenly you don't need the return value and then you don't need the parameter? Uh, no, that's not, no, 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 no. Uh, the reason is, 
Mm, it would not be that difficult. What we would need to do is to implement a topological sort, not on call graph, but on the flow of uh, parameters and, uh, and return values. That's the only thing that would change. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, but, but uh, uh, yeah, I haven't done it. But uh, another thing is for the do not set fault issue you, you phrased, uh, have you considered functions which uh, which are called before the access and might would don't don't touch the parameter in any way but might not actually exit uh, well might might exit uh, are not no return but like might 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 abort or call exit and so never reach the actual the reference I would have to have a look I must say that I copied this from what we have okay. already in, in uh, this bit was, is, is almost untouched. Uh, so I would have to have a look. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it was careful about, uh, about various calls. It is quite possible that it, that, that it doesn't, yeah, that, that, well, how it happens is that it, it propagates the maximum offset to the, to the, egg, to, to the uh, first basic block, entry basic block. And if it's big enough to cover the excess, then excess is eligible. It is quite possible that it doesn't pass through uh, calls, but I don't know. And the last thing is uh, for, for the parameter removals, we actually have debug info extensions, which we already emit, but we probably don't have anything like that for parameter uh, for return value removals. And might be we need some extension. Okay, uh, yeah. It's probably true. Uh, okay, unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. So thank you very much for your presentation.